Hi everybody. Welcome to Gilded Age number two, episode 10 in the grand scheme of things. Uh, before I get going too far, I want to talk about uh, 25 through 33. Um, you can see that over there. 25 through 33. Uh, Presidents 25 through 33, uh, McKinley, Teddy Taft Wilson, Harding Coolidge Hoover, FDR Truman. McKinley, assassinated. He's also Spanish-American War. Um, again, you all know that the World War I president and World War II presidents, Wilson and FDR, are Democrats. So is Truman, because Truman was the vice president for FDR. And so when FDR died, Truman became president. So he was also a Democrat. So Wilson, FDR, and Truman are the Democrats. You have to know Spanish-American War equals McKinley. You have to know World War I equals Wilson, and World War II <coughs> equals FDR and Truman. So again, I memorize it like this. McKinley, Teddy Taft Wilson, because they are the progressive presidents. Harding Coolidge Hoover, they are the Roaring Twenties. FDR and Truman, and they are World War II. Um, also the Great Depression, FDR is the Great Depression. So here we go, Old Grover takes over again. This is slide 131. Uh, we only have 40 slides to go today, so it should only be about 15 or 20 minutes for the video. <clears throat> Cleveland's return to the presidency was dominated by the Panic of 1893, leading to mass demonstrations and labor strikes and a growing dis dissatisfaction with the government's laissez-faire policies. Um, one, Grover's first name is Stephen. Why didn't you just go with Stephen? I don't know, but he went with Grover, so I don't know if they have a perfectly lovely name and you go with Grover, but he did. Uh, so Cleveland's return to the presidency, you know that they, he's the only one that was not... Uh, in, sequen in sequence that Harrison is in between them. The Panic of 1893, there was also a Panic of 1793, and a lot of that had to do with what is called bimetallism, which means silver and gold to back the money. And then later in 1873, they changed it to only be gold, and it threw everything into an uproar, and there was a panic. A panic is like a Great Depression, except uh, in 1893 was the biggest depression that we'd ever had until we get to the Great De Depression of the 1930s. So panics are like recessions or depressions. And it's uh, labor is not okay with these laissez-faire policies that are terrible for them, but great for big business. Okay, during this time, during this panic, this depression of 1893, it was dominated by economic problems. There were runs on banks, like 500 banks shut down. Uh, the FDIC is gonna be a Great Depression thing, which is called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corps, which means that your deposits, if you deposit money in the bank, even today, no matter what happens to the bank, if it gets blown away by a hurricane, no matter what happens, you will still be able to get your money from savings that it's not gone. The federal government is going to back that. Then, nope. If your money was gone, if the banks failed, if the banks went out of business, and you had thousands of dollars in there and you didn't get it out before these runs on the bank, you lose. There's no money. So that's a terrible, terrible thing. Lots of runs on the bank. So it began 10 days after Cleveland took office, 10 days. Um, several major companies went bankrupt, 16,000 businesses in total went bankrupt. Bank failures followed causing a contraction of credit. There's no money in the system and nearly 500 banks closed for good. And again, if your money was in those banks and they closed, you were in trouble. By 1895, unemployment reached 3 million, which was 20% unemployment, which is one fifth of the population of the country. So that's a huge number. Uh, were unemployed. Americans asked for relief, but the government continued laissez-faire economics policies and therefore no regulation. It was still pro-business and helpful for big business. People were very, very angry about that. This was the first major economic crisis since the U.S. industrialized after the Civil War. Thousands and thousands failed and the Treasury was running very low on gold. You have to know William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan equals populism. Um, think rural, think Shackle Island. Shackle Island would have loved William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan equals, um, wait. William Jennings Bryan equals very good for uh, rural areas, for laborers, for farmers. Uh, he's against tariffs, he's for free silver. Uh, silver is a lot more, uh, found a lot more than gold was. Uh, the rich people had the gold, the poorer people had the silver, so they want silver-backed currency. 
Uh, so William Jennings Bryan pushed for free silver printing money based on silver, not gold, but Cleveland refused because Cleveland is pro-business even though he's a Democrat. William Jennings Bryan. Cleveland turned to J.P. Morgan and August Belmont Jr. for help, who convinced Wall Street bankers to lend the U.S. government $65 million. They loaned the government $65 million. So that, you've heard of J.P. Morgan before, and you've heard of Belmont, which I thought was Belmont University. August Belmont Jr. is indeed a captain of industry in finance and banking. I thought it was railroads. It's not. It's finance and banking. And Belmont is just a former plantation, a summer home for some other family. I don't even know what they're called. But it was called Bell, B-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Mont. Bell means pretty. And Mont usually means like mountain or hill. And so it's in Nashville, and it was previously um, a plantation, and it's Belmont, Belmont. But it's not to do with August Belmont Jr., who is a captain of industry. So I lied to you. I'm trying to unlie to you. So General Jacob Cox, he led a demonstration against the federal government demanding help for unemployed Americans. He left from Massillon, Ohio, and walked to Washington, D.C. with a lot of the unemployed. Remember, thousands and thousands of people became unemployed after the Panic of 1893. They were called the Army of the Commonwealth of Christ, but most people just called it Coxey's Army after him. Uh, brought the protest to D.C. It was potentially a dangerous and disorderly situation. Uh, I think this is the most dangerous movement this country has seen since the Civil War. Intimidation of Congress by the presence of a body of armed men is rebel rebellion, pure and simple, and should be stamped out, just as the Great Rebellion was in 1861. 1861, it's the Civil War. Coxey and other leaders of protested were arrested for walking on the grass of Congress. They marched all of that way to demand their rights, and they arrested him and a bunch of other people for walking on the grass. Sent him on the way, the demonstration ended, it didn't accomplish anything. However, people were still proud of him, Coxey's army was one of only was only one of more than 40 different armies of the unemployed that headed for Washington in 1894 after the Panic of 1893, because they were all unemployed. They needed employment. They needed money. They needed to survive. There's no social safety net. That's FDR in the 30s. That's FDR in the 30s. That's FDR in the 30s. There's no unemployment. There's no social security. There's no retirement pension. There's nothing. If you have no money, you have no food, no anything. There's nothing. There's nothing that the government is protecting you. That's what he was trying to go there to, to get them to do. And indeed, he wanted to do public works projects by building federal buildings or bridges or roads, uh, which is what FDR is going to do in the 1930s. But Coxey said that to Congress, that they should do that. Well, he didn't get to talk to Congress, but the congressmen in the newspapers, he said they should do that. That's what FDR did. So 1894 Pullman strike in Chicago was led by American Railway Union, union leader Eugene V. Debs, you have to know Eugene V. Debs. He's going to land here on the socialist ticket. Eugene V. Debs is way, way, way left. <coughs> He's a socialist candidate, and he runs like four times for president, and he doesn't get elected any of the times, but he runs four different times, one of them from prison during World War I. We are born in a Pullman house, fed from the Pullman shop, taught in the Pullman school, catechized, catechized in the Pullman church, and when we die, we shall be buried in the Pullman Cemetery and go to Pullman Hell. So if you remember correctly, we were talking about plantations and sharecropping and that people had their shacks and their, where they lived was on this farm. They had to buy from the farm store and that we had debt peonage. The people were in horrible debt as a result of that because the landowner owned everything. They owned their house. They owned the shack. They owned the store. They made sure prices were high so that they always stayed in debt. Same thing. Company towns, they're called company towns. Everything in Pullman, Illinois, even the name of the town, is Pullman after George Pullman. And I think you remember that George Pullman made uh, palace cars, like the really beautiful, pretty cars for the rich people and the wealthy people. He made all kinds of train cars, but he's famous for the Pullman palace cars that the very, very wealthy bought. So they go on strike. They go on strike, 1894. Um, uh, I think 27 different states, railway workers joined them. In 20 different states, 27 different states. 1877 <coughs> was a great railway strike. And you remember that Hayes brought in federal troops to break that up. 
1886 was the Haymarket Square bombing, where somebody threw a bomb into the crowd, and then eight people were arrested and charged with that. Four of them killed, uh, four of them hanged. One of them blew himself up in prison. The other three were finally released. But they were proven that they were not the human beings that threw the bomb, but they still were put to death anyway in the United States of America, which isn't how our justice system works. And then 1894 is the Pullman strike. And the Pullman strike, uh, every one of these federal troops are sent in, police or federal troops, on the side of the businesses, not on the side of the laborers. And so you have to know about the Pullman strike. So what happens with this is that they put mail on the trains and so that I think it's Cleveland, uh, we'll see here in a second, can say, oh, well, we, we had to interfere and get involved because the U.S. mail is federal. And so since they were stopping distribution of the mail by stopping those trains, then we're going to send in troops to make sure that the trains are running. So that's how they broke it up. The palace car hurt by panic of 1873. They cut workers' wages, but they didn't cut their rent. They didn't cut their food. Like a third of the workers lost their jobs, and they had nowhere to go. They had nothing, so everybody went on strike. The struggle between the greatest and most important labor organization and the entire railroad industry. Trains got stopped. Food was not sent anywhere. People couldn't go anywhere. Trains all over the nation it came to a grinding halt. So there you go. 22nd, May 22nd, 94. President Cleveland claimed the strike interfered with the U.S. mail, and he sent in federal troops, and they crushed the strike. The U.S. government sent in troops when the strike turned violent. We already said that. Uh, Cleveland use of federal troops to end the Pullman strike was a questionable use of federal power and then very unpopular with the masses. 1895, you should know this also, the Supreme Court declared the graduated income tax unconstitutional, making the very wealthy people very happy. Uh, as you know, there's going to be a, an amendment made, I think around 1916, the 16th Amendment, for a graduated income tax. Uh, the poorer you are, the less you pay. The richer you are, the more you pay. That's what a graduated income tax is. So it's called a progressive tax. So the election of 1896, this is William Jennings Bryan. This is William Jennings Bryan. Populism, Democrat, William Jennings Bryan. This is McKinley. Uh, you guys already know how this story ends. That's, the, that's our quiz the next time I see you. McKinley, Teddy Taft Wilson, Hayes Garfield Art. Teddy Taft Wilson, Harding Coolidge Hoover. I don't know why I always keep doing that. Harding Coolidge Hoover, FDR, and Truman. McKinley, Spanish-American War. Teddy Taft Wilson, progressive presidents. Wilson's a Democrat. Wilson is also World War I. Harding Coolidge Hoover, that's the Roaring Twenties. All of them are Republicans, no war. Uh, FDR and then Truman. FDR is a Great Depression and then also World War II, as is Truman, World War II. And they are both Democrats. That's the next time I see you. Okay, so the election of 1896 pitted McKinley and the forces of the Gilded Age, the big businesses, against William Jennings Bryan and the populist platform. Remember populism, farmers, rural, uh, church, 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 um, conservative, which is normally over there, but the populist party is very conservative, church, uh, not big cities, rural areas. McKinley's victory was a victory for big business. They kept, think, captains of industry. But the liberal forces that would lead to the progressive era had been unleashed. Progressive era, we've just said it, Teddy, Taft, and Wilson. Okay, uh, it was become, between these two, populism, and it was revolved around the issue of gold versus silver. Clearly, the rich people wanted gold. That equals the big business. The poor people wanted silverback currency. That equals the poor people in the rural areas the God-fearing parts of the world. Populists saw the answer to America's problem was the unlimited coinage of silver. The more money they can make out of silver coins, again, the miners that are out west are finding lots and lots of silver and far less gold. So they wanted to be able to cash that silver in for real greenback dollars, for dollars. But we said, the government said, oh no, we're only gonna make dollars from gold. They're only gonna be backed by gold. So the big problem here is whether there's silver, that's what the poor people want, or gold, that's what the rich people want. They wanted to stay on the gold standard for our money. So Republicans, uh, popular Civil War vet, McKinley. McKinley supported laissez-faire economics and big business. Uh, remained on the gold standard and gold-backed money. 
Very few poor people had gold. So there you go. William Jennings Bryan, McKinley, gold and silver coinage. Democrats wanted Je uh, Bryan. At the turn of the century, when it most needed to be said, when it took a real courage, he spoke the meaning of America in words of fire. He kept insisting, and history will remember him for it, that America is not really America unless the lowliest man feels sure in his bones that he has free and equal opportunity to get ahead. This is kind of funny because this is by Clarence Darrow. Uh, in the 1920s is going to be the Scopes Monkey Trial. Some of you know about that, monkeys, and it's about evolution. And it is, they are going to be the two attorneys. Clarence Darrow is going to fight for evolution being taught in school. William Jennings Bryan, rural, conservative, Christian, is going to fight against evolution being in school. And then uh, William Jennings Bryan loses. Well, he wins, but the teacher only has to pay a dollar. So basically he lost. And it was such a, uh, Clarence Darrow made him look so ridiculous that within a week he actually died of a massive heart attack. But so this is ironic because Darrow is praising William Jennings Bryan about what he did for the common people. And they were antagonists in that trial. That's why it's a little crazy that he's doing that. But he still respected what William Jennings Bryan tried to do for common people. Okay, so this is famous, famous, famous called the Cross of Gold speech. And it is a passionate plea uh, for free silver by populists. Populist means population, means people. It is the People's Party, and people have silver, but they don't have gold. So when they take the dollar off of silver and gold, it was made by both before, then all the people that had silver were screwed. And so it destroys the, the poor people, the lower people, the common people. So this is Cross of Gold. This is the famous Cross of Gold. This is a political cartoon about the Cross of Gold. If you ever see this, Clearly, this is William Jennings Bryan. It's William Jennings Bryan. This is one of the most famous speeches of all of American history. I think that it's ranked like the top third or fifth highest, most famous speech of all of U.S. history. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this cross of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And that was enough to get him the nomination of, of the Democratic Party in 1896 against McKinley. McKinley won like 23 states. Uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan won like 22 states, and I think that McKinley had 2 million more popular votes. And so that was the closest that William Jennings Bryan came to being president. Uh, but however, he ran another two different times and doesn't get as close as he did against William McKinley. So by this point, the Democrats basically adopted the populist message, and so the populist party goes away because the Democrats take over that message. So populism is going to uh, take over the Democratic Party is going to be basically populist. Okay, and then this is uh, famously 16 to one. Fiscal conservatives were very concerned. McKinley's wealthy supporter, Mark Hanna, argued that Bryant and silver rights would be cutting people's earnings and saving in half, that if we let them use silver, that all of the rich people that had all of that gold that their money would be half as valuable if there was a William Jennings Bryan presidency. Uh, 16 to one, that means that Hanna and the Republicans spent $16 million to $1 million that the poorer people that supported William Jennings Bryan were able to spend. Needless to say, when you can spend that kind of money in a re-election campaign or in an election campaign, you're kind of screwed when the other side spends 16 times as much as you do. Uh, this is a famous cartoon, Demo Poptum, of course, because it's Democrat, populist, which is he, what is he, uh, 16 million to 1 million disadvantage, because people were afraid of Brian's radical ideas, M McKinley and his fundraiser Hannah raised enormous amounts of money for the campaign, because they had convinced the rich people that their gold was only going to be half as valuable if uh, William Jennings Bryan became president, and it worked. Okay, Republican conservatism is enthroned in McKinley. We are still going with this Republican and pro-big business, the president supporting big business. Uh, McKinley's victory in 1896 and recovery from the panic solidified the gold standard and killed any serious talks of silver ever again. Then our money was based on the gold standard after that. McKinley. Ohio, what up, baby? Ohio. 
Um, let me go forward and then back so the music stops. Whenever First Lady Ida McKinley suffered an epileptic seizure, and she suffered them often, the president would simply drape his handkerchief over her face. He covered his wife with a handkerchief if she was having a seizure. Okay, um, we need Hawaii just as much and a good deal more than we need California. It is manifest destiny. So it is during, during McKinley that we take Hawaii as another state. Bicycles are made around 1812 in Germany, but they become very popular with us around the 1880s. Remember, we don't have cars until like 1907-ish, 8-ish at that point. So bicycles, a lot of people had bicycles. The election of 1896 pitted the wealthy against the poor. The middle class voted for McKinley because they had a little bit of gold. Uh, Republicans kept the White House for the next 16 years until Woodrow Wilson. You know that part. Cleveland was a Democrat. Wilson's a Democrat. Uh, FDR is a Democrat. And Truman are Democrats. Uh, the tariffs were raised to a shocking 46.5%. That hurt farmers, but it helped the wealthy elites. It helps the wealthy elites <coughs> because we put high tariffs on imports so that the people that were selling the stuff here in the United States could raise their prices to whatever they wanted, and it basically became a tax on the poor, these tariffs. Uh, Congress passed the Gold Standard Act. Paper money was only redeemable in gold. Few civil rights remained in Congress, and the issue of silver is gone for good. Inflation occurred anyway. There were discoveries of gold in Alaska in the Yukon. I think you've heard of the Yukon Territory. Canada and South Africa was one of the largest gold mines. Okay, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, a lot of people believe this is based off of populism and William Jennings Bryan. Okay, uh, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was written in 1900. Baum was a supporter of the populist movement. That's William Jennings Bryan. And so they think that this was written about that. Uh, according to this, according to this, every man, main character can be traced to either a particular person or a group of people. Oz equals ounce of gold. Oz is ounces. Dorothy's journey to the Emerald City represents the march of Coxey's army. That's what it represents. The Yellow Brick Road represents the gold standard. Dorothy represents every man, the common man. Uh, she's an innocent Midwest girl who's able to see what's really going on in Oz. She wears silver shoes in the, in the book. She wears silver shoes, not ruby, because of the silver issue. Uh, the Wicked Witch of the West are the East Industrials, the industrialists and the bankers of the Far East, and not the Far East, the East in Washington, D.C. Munchkins equal the common people who are controlled by the Wicked Witch of the East. The scarecrow represents the wise but naive Western farmer taken advantage of by the industrialists and the bankers with these high rates on uh, railroads. Uh, the tin man represents the dehumanized industrial worker. He eventually becomes unable to love because all he does is work, 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 12, 14, 16 hours a day. So he represents the industrial worker. He's turned into a machine by the industrialists because of his hard work ethic and not having another craft to succeed in. But because they have to work so much, he's just like seen as a machine. And the cowardly lion is William Jennings Bryan. He roars and roars and roars, but nothing changed. He didn't get elected, nothing changed. The silver issue, he lost that. He has a loud roar, but he never gets elected. And the Wicked Witch of the West represents the Western industrial influence. Think of Stanford. Uh, she's ultimately destroyed by water, representing pure nature and the removal of machines. And then the Wizard of Oz symbolizes the U.S. presidents during the Gilded Age because they're all crap. They're all fake. They're all phony. They had the interest of big business, not of the people. Um, it was a big charade. They acted like they were important, important, but they were controlled by big business. Have a good day.